remember a few uh, meetings ago that uh, Brian very kindly had the map which was showing you how in uh, 1939 to 40, well, just the beginning of the war, uh, Germany had actually uh, conquered and moved over and absolutely absorbed the whole of that area. Um, I don't know what the next one is. Oh, that's here. Uh, this, this is where we, we get to. Uh, in uh, 1939, uh, uh, 1940, where Ge uh, the German troops had come down and the British Expeditionary Force had been forced right onto the, under the, uh, the, under the edge there. And so we have Dunkirk. And the amazing thing about it was that because they were more interested in getting down to Paris, obviously Dunkirk was a wonderful evacuation and some 350,000 Allied troops were brought across to UK, okay, in pretty uh, sorry condition, but uh, at least we'd got bodies there that we wouldn't have had if it had it taken. Just to cast your mind back to when you were 17 or 18, which is what, if you go that far back, I find it difficult going back, but on the other hand, uh, it's very, very clear in my mind. But as, as a teenager, I think you'll all agree, whether it's yourself or your grandchildren or, or children, that in, those, uh, in the teenage, you are single-minded. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, if you want it, you'll find ways and means uh, of getting it. And as far as I was concerned, uh, I had see, I lived through uh, all that sort of thing, and all I wanted to do was actually to get into the air force. Um, if, I, if I remember rightly, these are photographs before I actually got into the air force of the preparation for the invasion. They're the invasion barges ready for Hitler's uh, people to come over. And uh, as far as I was concerned, um, I've been pestering the um, recruiting sergeant and what he said was uh, go and join the local volunteers which lately became the Home Guard and that's, that's something you could talk about for ages. But uh, anyway, we were, we were literally uh, believing that if they came and the older pe the people who had been uh, in, the in the First World War, they said, lad, You've got, you've got five bullets in your, in your rifle, make sure you take one of the bastards down before you go. And, that's all, and that was, um, as a youngster, that's what you've got to do. But um, as far as I was concerned, just um, a, a little bit further, what we got here? For, forgive me, I, I'm blind, as you can see. I've still got my blind flying certificate, but they won't let me use it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I, was, I was anxious, to, uh, and I pestered the, the, uh, the bloke, uh, the flight sergeant. Eventually, he gave me a copy of some older entrance exams, which I took, and on my 18th birthday, which is what they had to, to uh, uh, make sure that you were, He'd already found out that I couldn't shave when I was 16 and a half. But the, uh, the thing was that it was the best thing that I'd ever done because I, I, I'd already got my number, I'd, got, I'd passed my exams, and so I went straight in. I went to ITW and was anxious to fly. And I just briefly say at ITW, and some of you may remember, that Hitler's deputy, uh, Rudolf Hess, flew from Germany across to Scotland to the west coast and bailed out there and asked to be taken to the Duke of Hamilton uh, uh, because he knew him and they dealt with uh, him uh, at various functions before the war. Uh, he, he was eventually Scotland Yard recalled in. Um, Churchill was advised about it, said he didn't want anything to do with him, sho shove him in the Tower of London. And that was the last we heard of him uh, until the Nuremberg trial. There was a lot of speculation that he'd come over with a peace plan, etc., etc. 
but under the Secretary Act that was enforced then for 100 years, any of you who are around in 1941, let me know what the answer was. <laughs> in, in, in 1941, that proves how old I am. Um, in 2041, rather. So, anyway, uh, I was lucky enough uh, to become part of the General Arnold scheme. Winston Churchill had been constantly in touch with uh, Roosevelt. Uh, his uh, military advisor said, well, look, if they can send us some blokes who want to fly, we'll train them, and uh, you know, it keeps uh, it, it, uh, our new ta neutrality uh, intact. Um, and the uh, procedure, and I won't go into any, any detail, in fact, five or six years ago, I went on for some nearly an hour ravaging on about it, but I'll try and get that to it. The idea was send them into, into Canada, change them into, make them civilians, so we all changed into uh, grey flannel suits, saw the uh, American attaché there, and in the middle of the night we went from Toronto to Detroit, thence across to, uh, I forgot what it was now, the Louisiana or something else, uh, the Andrews sisters, for those of you who remember, it was the Chattanooga Choo Choo <laughs> on track 29. But um, we were put in, or oh, seconded into the US Army Air Corps. We had a flight lieutenant who made sure we got to the camp. We were uh, down in Georgia and in Alabama and Florida. And uh, we went in just as civilians. And we were subjected to and became uh, Air Corps cadets. The um, ridiculous um, discipline that was enforced um, would make uh, Duntroon look, like, look rather like a holiday camp. A lot, a lot of the blokes, the older fellows, the blokes about 24 or 25, uh, told the various officers where they could put their uh, discipline and they were sent straight back to Canada. But the main thing about it, and we're talking about flying, the good thing was, as far as I was concerned, the steersman. many of you here may well have flown a steersman, and I think you'll agree, one of the most docile and pleasant aircraft to fly. Um, we had civilian instructors on those, and they didn't want anything to do with the US Army Air Corps. All they wanted to do was to teach anybody who wanted to fly, and as far as our kids, or me as a kid was concerned, I didn't mind what I had to put up with as long as I could fly. And uh, a lot of the stuff that I, my instructor gave me there stood me in fantastic st uh, stead for the rest of my flying time. Uh, we were, we were, this is in the days, and think, think back to, this was when segregation and slavery was still there under the, uh, under the carpet, but the people, the uh, coppers who put on the knickerbockers on their guns to just prove anything like that. And the, everything was black, blacks there and whites there. But regardless of that, we then went on to basic training, which was the uh, BT-13, it was a Northrop, a, a lower wing monoplane, full of instrument panel, but a fixed undercarriage with, uh, it, for me, it was a car on the one. It, it was one of these aircraft that you could pull up and it, and it would stall to the left. And the next one you got it, it stalled stall to the right. And the fact that if you did a power stall, you wouldn't have a clue where it was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> got through that and uh, went on to advanced training, which is the Harvard. And there again, probably all of you, or most of you, from the Harvard, and I think you'll agree, one of the ni nicest aircraft to fly. Um, we, we, we graduated there. Uh, usual Hollywood style, marching girls, bands, and all the rest of it. At least, at least I got my what later was referred to as our tin wings, and uh, an honorary commission in the U.S. Army Air Corps. I had 72 hours, which I went to uh, down to Miami and Florida. And looking back on my diary, and I won't go into it, but uh, Toronto was Florence, and uh, Albany was Ruth, and uh, <laughs> that, that was uh, Virginia, that's right. Uh, <laughs> within se uh, 72 hours, we were back in Canada, and it was whilst we were, I was down uh, at our advanced that we were paraded, 
and um, we had Roosevelt tell us about Pearl Harbor. And uh, everything changed quite dramatically. There was a lot of panics about thinking the, Jap the uh, Japanese were going to bomb New York, but th uh, that was <laughs> a little unrealistic. But we came back, uh, no, no problem. We had the PBYs uh, and the Canadian Air Force escorting us, whereas previously, uh, and the Battle of Atlantic, when I went across, we were thought that we went up to uh, Greenland and came across, but with two destroyers going around us to safeguard us. Came back uh, to UK, and uh, fortunately, I had my kit stuffed full of silk stockings, nylon stockings, <laughs> lipstick, and various cosmetics, which. Uh, had the advantage of not only had I got some wings, but I'd also got some stuff that was very valuable in those days. I won't bother to go into all the details of them, but I can remember them very well. <laughs> the, um, we, went, we, we, we had a, um, a week's leave, and then it was straight on to uh, AFU. Uh, and there, we flew the Miles Master. That was a Mark One, and we flew at one and two. Uh, a little bit of a come down, as far as I was concerned, after having flown Harvard's. Um, I had a couple of experiences with it. One, the uh, the wheel, wheels wouldn't come down, uh, and although the tower told me to do tight turns, put, uh, dives, and pull, and whatever I did, uh, nothing happened. So I did a belly landing. Plenty the prop, but that, and the uh, air intake, but nothing much to it. And two days later, um, I had an engine cut out at 2,000 feet, but fortunately I could land that uh, at the airport. And the flight commander said, oh, well, one cancels out the other, so it's all right. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was happy because I was only nine miles from where we, I was living previously. The main thing about it was that as a, uh, as a youngster, as a, all I wanted to know is uh, I've done my training, I have your next thing is OTU and then it's on to the squadron. And every day uh, at AFU, paraded and the various people went to various OTUs and eventually my name was called out with Bill Johnson, who was obviously alphabetically near to me, and we'd been through the course together, and so we said, right, where are we going? And uh, they said, oh, yeah, you, you're, uh, you're going to uh, Harrogate. Uh, go to bloody Harrogate, what do I want to go to Harrogate for? And they said, oh, it's a GR course, a general reconnaissance course. I said, well, I don't want anything to do with that. And of course, I think you all know that when you're in a, a, a group of, doesn't matter whether it's just people here, but the word goes round that if you, if you complete this course, this general reconnaissance course, you'll be sent to Coastal Command and uh, you'll go on to Wellingtons or Wimpies and you might even go on to Sunderland, God knows what. And so Bill and I, when we got there, were, were, were pretty hacked off. And so much so that although we could cope with the majority of the stuff, a lot of it, as far as we were concerned, completely irrelevant. And in fact, if, if you can imagine, this, this hotel, uh, Harrogate, if you don't know, is, is a spa town where people, all the landed gentry before the war, went off to take the water, which actually was pretty revolting as far as I was concerned. Um, but th this uh, uh, marvellous old majestic hotel was ideal. You, they could turn the ballroom into various uh, lecture halls, you could uh, put all the bods up in all the rooms, but more importantly, stood in about five acres of ground. And from the top uh, uh, windows up there, they, they could do all the uh, transmission and they also could do uh, the ordinary Morse code. And we had to go down the end of the bed to uh, take the, these messages. And, and Bill and I said, that's a lot of rubbish. And so when uh, they, he would uh, be transmitting, you know, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, flight two, three, return to base, uh, acknowledge, and so on and so forth, and we'd write down, oh, see you in the hydro, um, which was a, <laughs> uh, a pub in town that was a bit of repute, and uh, 
the, the same <laughs> applied as far as the Morse code was concerned, and you get got a whole string of stuff, and uh, we, we used to say, oh, take this beer up here as that. Um, the, uh, the, the water was bad enough, we reckon the beer was even worse. <laughs> <coughs> the outcome of it was, we were up in front of the CEO, and <laughs> he said, um, gentlemen, I believe you have been fannying about. Would you like to make any comment? And Bill and I said, look, we've been uh, trained on single-engine aircraft. We've done a higher view on single-engine aircraft. We want to be posted to an OTU, and we want to fly Spitfires or Hurricanes at the very least, and we really feel that we, you know, we, we want to get there, not that. And he said, no, oh, yes, and uh, I'm in charge of a course here, and I'm judged on the uh, amount of people that pass it. He said, and you've been just faffing around here. And he said, I've actually got uh, two options. He said, uh, my first option is to kick you off the course with a recommendation that you're on foot for, for flying duties and have a strong recommendation for the bomb disposal scope or the uh, catering floor. <laughs> now, any of you who know what it's like to want to fly, that is pretty dazzling. He said, on the other hand, and he had a very clever psychology here, he said, if you pass uh, with over 85% in, in aggregate, I'll guarantee that you go to uh, a single engine OTU. And uh, understood? And he said, yes, sir. He said, right, well, bugger off. <laughs> <laughs> And Bill and I went out, and there was no question about it, whatever it was. I mean, we had been taking, we, we pointed out that we'd been taking sexton shots. Now, we, we pointed out that there wasn't room in the Spitfire for sexton. <laughs> and that we, we'd, put, we'd proven that we were actually, when we took the shots, looked up the uh, charts, to, rather like logarithms, and we were categorically south of Beijing. <laughs> Instead of north, north of York. But any, anyway, uh, he was as good as his word. Uh, both Bill and I uh, passed with our, our marks were within 0.1 of a percent of uh, what was required. And uh, lo and behold, we were given seven days leave and then went to number 8 OTU. And uh, the that was up in Fraserburgh in the north of Scotland. And when we arrived, we went down to the flight. The first thing you do, we go down to the flight line. And what did we find? We found some masters, uh, three, three masters. They were Mark threes, And the, uh, the ground crew reckoned they were a lot better than the ones and twos. I said they couldn't be any worse. Um, and there was a Spitfire, and that, uh, that is one of that's. Uh, a Mark One. Uh, there's a, we had a Mark Two, and four Mark Fives, and uh, it was a question of you know, getting down. The reason I uh, belaboring this just one a bit more was that the next morning uh, we went, uh, we were assembled, and I had imagined that it was like all the other old two years there'd be. 100, 200 of us, there were eight of us. And we went in and the uh, um, board officer uh, told us to attention, the uh, commanding officer was coming in. And lo and behold, it was the uh, wing commander, Douglas Hamilton, the uh, Earl of Hamilton who Hess had uh, tried to contact. He was a serving officer and he was part of a, he'd been in the Air Force for quite some time and in fact he'd been involved in not only photographic reconnaissance but the general uh, build up in the 30s of the air, of aircraft and Air Force and he'd met his in, in Germany on a couple of official uh, meetings there and it, he was one in the first flight that ever flew uh, in biplanes over the top of Everest. But um, the, the main thing about it was, um, and I'm sure you know what I mean, where you, you, a, a person walks into the room and he isn't bombastic or anything like that, 
But he commands your attention immediately, just quietly and authoritatively. Says, gentlemen, uh, and he called us all by name, and I don't know why he called us gentlemen, but that's the thing that obviously dukes do. But uh, he uh, said, uh, I heard in the mess last night that we'd been down to the flight line and there were no guns. And he said, uh, and they took deathly hush. And he said, well, I'm here to tell you that you've been selected, uh, you have proven you can fly, you have proven that you can navigate, and now we want you to take part in what I consider to be the most important intelligence ever, and that is photographic reconnaissance, because the side that has the best intelligence will win this war. And uh, the, the way he put it, and, and he said, you've been taught to fly, now I want you to learn how to fly, not only to get your target, but to get back. It's probably so more important you're coming back than getting there. And uh, so this was so, uh, something that we really embraced. Uh, coming back to the photograph on the screen is, a, is about one single pr uh, prop. And uh, I may have told you before, as I said, the, it had a pump out uh, undercarriage. So that obviously um, when you are holding the joystick here and then pumping the undercarriage, it'd be sort of like this so your take off. It was a bit <laughs> like, like that. But I was, uh, I was interviewed um, or just after Anzac Pride and we were talking to him and said, what's, what is your most memorable thing? We were talking about family and all the rest of it. And I said, without any doubt, my first flight in, in a Spitfire was the most memorable uh, of, of anything that I had experienced up until then. And I think that any of you who have flown it, I think will agree with me, or if you've seen it, or if you've sat in it, and you, you, are, you are part of the aircraft. And it's such a wonderful aircraft that you almost have to sort of think, I'll go that way, and it goes. Uh, but um, the, the main thing about it was we, we had a uh, warrant officer Dixon who had flown in the Battle of Britain, and for the first time, um, we learned how to side slip, because previously, if you side slipped, you were just whitewashed out. And the, uh, the sort of thing that we did, in, in actually on the flying side of it, was to learn to fly and learn to observe and evade anybody else uh, in a Spitfire that was trying to you know, shoot you down. It was here that uh, we learned not, learned not only about our cameras, uh, they were, as Brian just mentioned, uh, we're talking now about 41, and uh, we had two cameras, 24, was fitted underneath the uh, um, fuselage with, with an, at an angle that gave you a 60% overlap. And that meant to say that when you took any one sequence, you could put on stereoscopic, uh, which we'll show you in a moment, uh, and get a full 3D picture, which was absolutely incredible, yeah. and led to a fantastic amount of intelligence. Um, it was also uh, here that I first heard about Sidney Cott. In, in uh, uh, Babington Smiles' uh, book, she, sa she said, and I think it's true, had he been born a hundred years earlier, he would be a buccaneer. Because, um, just uh, as Brian said, he's the sort of fellow that you could uh, have a, an hours program and listen to his exploits. Briefly, he uh, was a Queenslander. He joined the uh, Royal Navy in, U in the UK. He learned to fly and was in the uh, Royal Air uh, uh, Service. And after the war, uh, continued flying uh, went to Canada, all sorts of places, with all sorts of schemes. He was a, uh, an opportunist, uh, an entrepreneur,
call it what you will, but quite a, a character. And in, on one occasion, after he'd been over to Libya, he, uh, Libya, uh, he had got um, color films were just beginning to be seen in America, and he was trying to sell people the idea. He loved it at uh, Malta and met um, Flight Lieutenant uh, Winterbottom, who uh, was not just Flight Lieutenant, he was in MI5 and all part of the uh, intelligence service. And he said to um, uh, Cotton, when you go back to London, you know, come and see us and you, we might be quite interested in this. And so off he went and he flew around Europe. We came back to London, formed a, a company, quite uh, official, in that he was uh, based in London and he set up ha having managers in sort of Vienna, and Berlin, and so that he, he was flying around. And the uh, British intelligence said, look, uh, what I think would be a good idea if you'd sort of give us a, a running report and let's have some of your films and uh, we would be happy to sort of help you. And on, if we get to 1938, you all remember Chamberlain coming back from Munich, waving his uh, piece of paper saying there will be peace in our time and that Hitler had signed an non-aggression pact, etc. And in that year, there was a, a large air show in Germany, about uh, oh, 100 or so k's from uh, Berlin, and all sorts of people were coming. Uh, and um, Cotton, uh, who had got a, a Lockheed, uh, I don't know whether it was a Beechcraft or whatever, but he got a little Lockheed, which he said sitting in the, co the copy there, and uh, being a, a very clever fellow, inventive in, in many ways. In fact, he, in, he invented the, the Sitcock uh, uh, four-piece suit that the Bomber Command, uh, I think we've got the picture somewhere, but uh, the, the point was that he went to this air show, and of course the, the generals and the Luftwaffe and everybody were there, and they were very interested in his aircraft, and they wanted to know whether they could have a flight in it. And he said, oh yes, we could do that. And of course they, he, they said, uh, and one uh, general said, he said, oh, my, my uh, great aunt or grandmother lived in the Rhineland and he'd like to have a look. And he flew them around and uh, with a, um, uh, a, a secret panel that he had, he, he was able to flick on to uh, take pictures, not only of the Rhineland and anybody's home, but they, they were all pr uh, very proud to say, well, this is the aerodrome, look at all the our aeroplanes there. And this is an am ammunition dump. And this is where we make this and that and the other. He came back and convinced the uh, Air, Air Force and the uh, general well, the government that Hitler was ready for war. There wasn't any really question about that. Uh, and came back uh, when really it was terribly difficult to get out of Germany and of course we know now that um, it was almost uh, this was in the uh, July and of course September we had, had war. Uh, once I got to, to the squadron uh, I was sent up to, to WIC to 1406 uh, flight which was part of four, uh, 14 squadron and the, uh, the first uh, one of the first jobs we had to do was to actually go down and find the, uh, where the Shantos and Gord Kadaisa now was. And we did a, a square search. Uh, I, uh, on, on the first leg, uh, was able to uh, think and find what I thought was the Shantos. Uh, Base came back and said, you know, bring down some evidence. So I went down and put on the oblique. And the oblique is a very clever, uh, mechanized thing. You had a yellow mark painted on the front of your wing, and you pressed the fire button when after five seconds, and that operated the oblique camera, and you, you were flying at 50 feet. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, uh, I heard some hail, I thought, uh, and I obviously got uh, uh, hit. The, uh, and, but climbed, climbed, climbed away, and at uh, 7,000 feet, uh, she went very, very rough, 
and the black smoke and the oil pressure went down. And so I went straight on to 270 and hoped that I'd be able to get over land. Uh, when it uh, caught on fire, I actually didn't have a big decision. Uh, one of the good things we had, we had a pack of cards and uh, there's the uh, uh, Measure Spit 109. The, the main aircraft that were doing us damage at height and there. Uh, and so when we played uh, poker or whatever it was, we could do aircraft recognition at the same time. Uh, the, uh, the other thing, the thing was, as far as I was concerned, uh, when, when, I, when it got on fire, it did the usual business of uh, roll over and uh, uh, just pop out, kick, kick the stick, see when he came out. Landed up in Scotland, uh, another story there. But th this is the sort of thing, and this is a, a, a day that you could have made a day afterwards. Uh, Bobby Indian uh, smiled. Terrific girl, I, I met her in bed, then since she was a flight officer then. And uh, unless you've got three or four rings, you couldn't get anywhere near her. But the, uh, <laughs> she was, but apart from good looking and came from uh, arist uh, aristocracy, uh, she was an excellent, was a cheap and interpreter photograph and had a fantastic memory. The main thing about it was that the, they had now got to the stage where, after all, we were, we were bringing back miles of film. And that's the Bismarck, uh, which was found, uh, went out into the uh, North Sea and of course sunk the hood. Uh, uh, Churchill said sink the Bismarck. Eventually, uh, PRU found the Bismarck again, and the, as you know, fleet our arm went in torpedoes, got under the rudder, and it went down, and the Navy came in and sunk it, etc. Uh, here is another one. This is from uh, the fields <coughs> up in Norway. Uh, we've got the uh, Prince Jorgen and the Turpits, and uh, again, the uh, uh, Navy, uh, the, the fleet air arm went in. They've got uh, nets around and it, it didn't do any damage, but the uh, bomber command went in with the armor pl plating uh, piercing bombs, and there's the turbines going up. That was the end of that. Uh, this is a, to show you the uh, stereoscopes that the girls were using and interpreting. Uh, these are some of the uh, obliques uh, with, uh, with talk I was just talking about, and this shows you the tank traps and they had uh, uh, charges in, so that the landing craft, as they hit them, uh, went uh, up. Um, here is a, a, an oblique of the Admiral Hipper in dry dock. Uh, the two days later, the bomber command went in and got rid of it. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is, is something that uh, I've learned since because we would take pictures and, uh, and say, what the hell were we taking in the photographs of that was? But now the, the wave formation, you must probably know that if you can, if you know the length of the, uh, the, uh, of the vessel or the uh, uh, displacement, you know that the waves come along and by a fairly simple formula, you can work out the speed but, uh, that the uh, ship or whatever it is using and so that became very uh, important uh, that that's a mark uh, six which has got elongated <coughs> wings which gave us greater stability uh, over 36,000 and uh, the, uh, oh this is one of, of the Mona Dam uh, after the bomb um, uh, after the bouncing bomb had gone through and uh, thousands of uh, people were killed. Uh, th this was uh, me after, uh, we just got our Mark 9s and they, they were terrific because uh, we, could, we could operate over 40,000. We could get there with, uh, with the 6 with the, the wing, but we needed more power and uh, this we had. And we're now talking about the sit cut uh, uh, flying suit, as you can see. Uh, May West and uh, st stockings, the rest of it, because the uh, cockpit got salmon cold. And one of the things that uh, you might, uh, if you're thinking about it, uh, when, when you when you're flying, uh, you you had 
three things that you had you had your target we got a donkey computer on, on your right knee and a map on your left knee held by elastic bands or whatever and uh, above that every every five thousand feet you gave a weather report we had a, a, um, a thermometer out on the starboard wing and so when you got up to minus 40 or something like that it could get quite cold but by the time uh, we got the nines we were getting some heating into the concrete and a certain amount of pressurization in the early days when i first started uh, you had no thing like that and of course as you went up your whole body distended and uh, had to get rid of it which you did and then of course the conversely coming down afterwards that was uh, and talking about coming down, um, one of the things that I found was that uh, I had, uh, after, after I'd bailed out and uh, got back to the squadron, the CEO said, uh, well, I, I think you ought to have a 48 pass. Uh, it was after he told me to go up and do an air test. And uh, he said, I said, but look, from here, it takes me 40 hours to get to, to London. So it's no good to me. He said, well, uh, we'll have a navigation trip. Uh, I understand you're going to get married. You won't like to see your fiance. Where's your nearest aerodrome? I told him that as each Spitfire went up one grade, then the British men did, or vice versa. <laughs> and so uh, you, you, learn, you learn to swivel your head and look at your glass, because one of the things that you over-target, at first you had to be at 36,000. We, we could go up to 40, but then get down to 36,000, and you've got the momentum to get away if you had to quickly. But you flew straight and level for one minute on a given easterly course. You then did a right one turn and came back over the target, and you were then paid, uh, pulling you for home. But in that, those two or three minutes, you were pretty vulnerable. And, and they got pretty clever. They would uh, say that the Germans would. Uh, they knew that if you were coming over at that height, uh, they couldn't get up to get you on the way in. So what they did is they climbed up and waited for you to come out. And so the uh, this one is, is this one uh, is that a pin a pin a wonder right uh, off the Baltic coast. Terribly important because. Um, uh, one of the squadron leader from uh, Benson had gone out. He had uh, found uh, the island. The intelligence had said that various things, and they were looking for the uh, V1s. Uh, they were looking for a, a bomb that, that would fly. And um, they went, uh, the bomber command went over and uh, uh, bombed it and put a, put a stop to it to group. But later, uh, when they were looking, this is uh, uh, looking for the actual skid launches of, of the V1, which is nothing more than a flying bomb with a gyro on. And th there it is uh, on the skids. And if you could get a photograph of the, the actual launch, you, could, you knew its course and you knew its speed. And so therefore you could get aircraft of the tactical air force in place to do it. And one of the things they had to be very careful of was that if you came down and shot it, the thing blew up. And it, and it did damage to you as well as anybody else. And so if they could get down and put your wingtip under there and lift it up, disrupted the jar, it went down hopefully into the sea. And uh, these are the launch pads uh, that were uh, we were looking for and uh, found. Uh, we, then, we then found that from all the photographs that we continually took over Pinamunda, there were pads. And this is the result of the pads, and there's uh, a V2 uh, taking off. And uh, we now know that, that if, if that had gone on very much further, these are interesting ones taken uh, just before D Day. Uh, of some of the other defences um, that are all around the beach. We had been sent to photograph the beaches, and the, the only thing I learned about it afterwards was that everybody who landed um, 
Uh, is that uh, yeah. garbage? Garbage. Yeah. Um, the thing we learned that was that every every commander or everybody in each of the boats that went ashore had a photograph of what they would see as they landed. Not a map. They had a photograph, and so. And this was taken, I think, at half past ten on July the sixth. Did it, it say that? No. But anyway, that was that was what it was taken. The th the thing was one one other thing to that uh, I, on a personal note, uh, my my wife knew uh, roughly how long I, she she came up and lived with the other squad. We had a a crofter's cottage on the cliff at Wick, and she knew roughly uh, how long I'd be gone. So rather than uh, let her worry about it. I said, I'll let you know when I go. So I came out of the circuit, dropped down, went over the cottage cottage, and just knew I was away. That was good. And she knew that within, whatever, four or five hours, uh, I should be back. And then and I dropped down to sea level just before uh, coming and came up over the house. So that was fine. She knew I was back. And then she didn't have to wait for me to be debriefed and, 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 uh, and then bike home, sort of thing. <laughs> That worked out terribly well until one time I didn't come back. And uh, that was purely and simply that it got to 26,000 and it was, they just put in a two-stage supercharger. And that actually uh, had got enlarged fan blades and the outer fan blades disintegrated, which in an engine doesn't do an awful lot of good. But, uh, and so I, I was pleased that I was at 26,000 because at least I knew I could hopefully get back. And I knew, I knew that there was a, an auxiliary airfield not far away from Wick. And uh, I, I came back and I saw the beach and I thought, well, shall I put it on the beach? And I thought, no, I won't do that because that's, that's mine. Uh, so I, <laughs> so I, I, I dragged, it, dragged it over towards the uh, auxiliary airfield and having jettisoned the hood because oil was everywhere and I leaned out to come into land, uh, clipped the fence and let my rather heavy landing went forward uh, and broke my nose and uh, climbed out of the cockpit and because the people from the uh, ambulance came rushing up and I, I'm wiping oil and blood and I, I, I must have looked as if I was just going to be decapitated. <laughs> <laughs> and he rushed me off to sick bay and the bloke, the doctor wiped me up and he said, I've seen worse than that, I'm a rugby fan. <laughs> <laughs> and he, anyway, uh, I, of the 300 that went with me to America, um, 200 were sent back to Canada and of the 100 that were left, I kept in touch with quite a lot of them till the end of the war, and there were three of us left. And uh, last uh, year, I heard that the last of the, or the, the other, what, there were two of it, and myself, and uh, I'm afraid that I'm now the only survivor. I'm lucky. <laughs>